Hello everybody and welcome to this latest video discussion as part of the RICS Tech Partner Program. My name is Andrew Knight and I've been with RICS for over 12 years now. I sit within our thought leadership and analytics part of the organisation and my role is to look at the impact of data and technology right across the built and natural environment. And with over 110,000 members worldwide working right across that property life cycle all the way from land, planning and development, construction, brokerage, valuation, finance, building and asset management, building surveying and indeed end of life, it's a very broad canvas which, uh, upon which data and tech is having a huge effect. And in fact, our members also work across all the major asset types, whether that's land itself, residential, commercial, infrastructure and alternative assets. So once again, a very, very varied set of practice areas that our members are involved in. Uh, and I'm really glad today to have uh, Isabel join me from Circular. So welcome to the discussion, uh, Isabel. Thanks very much, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure, pleasure. Now, before we get into the bits and bites and the kind of value proposition of what you're doing at Circular, it's always nice to have a bit of a human element. So it'd be great to hear about a bit about your backstory, uh, Isabel. Yeah, great. So um, nothing really outstanding. I just saw a problem which um, I knew was a knotty one and really wanted to find a solution. So um, my background is really rooted in environmental science and climate change. I got my MA from uh, Copenhagen University um, and there I was studying soil in, uh, in the Arctic, um, which gave me a lot of opportunity to learn about climate change, but very little opportunity to actually work and make an impact um, on it. Um, so my family are deeply rooted in construction. My father was, has been a quantity surveyor for uh, 40 years. He won't thank me for saying that. Um, and my grandfather before him was a building surveyor and so on. <laughs> Back <laughs> you, uh, a many, uh, many a generation. Um, so I went to work in the, in the family business um, working uh, in quantity surveying, but also in the sustainability side. And that's when I got to know um, the whole life carbon assessment and the sticky problem of how do we align uh, our construction data with LCA data and kind of bring that carbon into the decision, decision making process. Um, so the, these are the, the kind of landmarks that led me to founding Circular. Indeed. And I suppose my next obvious question, it's come almost two questions at once, is what problem are you solving and how are you doing that? Yeah, so um, maybe to, to take it back to the beginning, um, I was working in an SME, uh, Quantity Surveying Practice, mainly um, residential and commercial um, fit outs um, and, and new builds. And it was a heavy project flow. Um, I'm sure many of the child surveyors listening will know that the work never stops piling up on your desk. And uh, it's, it's a lot of laborious Excel and pen and paper exercises. Um, that, that just pull a lot of hours out of your day to then add the um, the sort of um, the carbon element to it it is another layer of work which you don't really have time for um, so I found that the the um, addition of carbon data it wasn't a very scalable one at that level um, so what I started off with was a macro spreadsheet, um, as we all start with, <laughs> with uh, some carbon factors in it and some uh, clever formulas which applied the carbon factors automatically um, and did a lot of the calculus for you. It was still very clunky and uh, still took a lot of time to operate, um, but I was lucky enough to um, meet an old friend in the pub who uh, was a full stack software developer and uh, opened me up to a wealth of possibilities for how we could automate this sheet and use some really clever um, AI programs um, and fuzzy logic searching to, um, to automate that process from, from end to end. 
so that was the goal from the outset um, to start with the billing materials to start with a cost plan and end up with a carbon report um, in, in one step and I suppose without going into sort of huge depth in bits and bytes uh, Isabel how does your tech solve this problem because you've articulated very well the kind of the status quo of spreadsheets and, and, and say you know bill of quantum bill of materials and, and probably disparate data sources and some of them quite unstructured and inconsistent what what's the tech doing under the bonnet to really solve that problem so um, we start off with um, the typical data set that you'd have during sort of the value engineering phase um, so we we say to our users uh, sort of a stage two to stage four cost plan is is what we need um, including sort of the, um, the the contractor's cost plan and the one that's going to site. Um, so that sort of level of technical detail is what we need. And as simply as, as I can say it, we need a description of a material, a quantity and a unit. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of variability <laughs> in there, um, including the units, which uh, we've been struggling with um, all kinds of uh, crazy different units that we didn't know existed. A small boy's pocket full <laughs> came across. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's all sorts of quirks that we found during that data inputting stage, um, but we really aim to be able to take in um, unspecific data, uh, which is human inputted and um, human formatted into a sheet. So that sheet doesn't have to be uh, in a particular schema. So you can, you can have your own branding, your own colors. As long as you have description quants and units in three columns, we can understand what you mean and pass out that information. So that was step one. Um, step two is the rather more tricky part mm -hmm. where we read those descriptions and try and understand what the specifier meant um, so everybody specifies differently and we type those uh, specifications into a sheet in most cases. Um, there's some cases where uh, you might be selecting from a drop down menu or, or a price book um, and a specific codified um, answer. Those are, those are the nice ones, um, but 99% of cases is, is person typing into a sheet. So um, that is, is natural language. Um, so what we've done is employed a large language model to read that natural language. And so for, to cut the jargon, um, that's ChatGPT. Um, so ChatGPT have a, um, uh, an API. So we can plug into the engine of ChatGPT and access their, their AI capabilities um, and use it to classify that construction data. So if something says concrete, okay, we're gonna send it off to our, our concrete EPDs and search over those. If it says concrete without an E at the end, mm -hmm. we're still gonna send it to the <laughs> concrete EPDs and search over them and try and figure out what these, these line items mean. Um, the next step is the, the fuzzy logic searching. So um, this, this is the same kind of search engine that you'd get with Google. Mm. So you type in a passphrase or a, a string of keywords um, and you know, you'll get back the um, most likely search items. Um, and this is how we apply the carbon data to the construction data. So we have a database um, through a, a supplier called EC3, um, and they have over 100, uh, yeah, 180,000 um, carbon data points, which is fantastic because it's very thorough and it's, it's all of the EPDs that are out there. However, it's very confusing for um, a consultant to manually go through all of those EPDs and try and choose the best one for what is most likely a very unspecific uh, description of a material. So we've, we've written an algorithm laced with assumptions which helps the specifier with that process and can help them find uh, the most appropriate choice for the specification that is put down. 
And then from there on, we do all of the calculus on the back end. Um, so you bring in the LCA assumptions. So it's not just the factor for the material, yeah. it's how often does it need to be replaced? What's gonna happen to it at the end of life? Um, and all of these assumptions need to be baked in and taken into account. Um, so we handle that process uh, for the user too. Now, the risk of going off a slight tangent, Isabel, I mean, you've obviously managed the, you know, the, the keywords of the current zeitgeist, large language models and chat GBT and, and AI in general. I mean, how do you see, you know, these new tools affecting, you know, the construction sector and, and you know, the, 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 the issues you've described about data management? We don't just apply to obviously carbon calculations, but more generally with the kind of variation, to put it diplomatically, you get in terms of construction data. Yeah, um, it's a big question and I don't really have a straight answer. Um, but to kind of come back to um, the big problem that as I see it in construction, um, when I was in my first job um, interning in a QS practice, all of the filing was um, printing off A1 sheets, big, big plans of, um, of, of buildings and then the cost plans and then all of the uh, the documentation for the project that was put into a brown envelope and then put into a file box and that file box was put on a shelf <laughs> <laughs> in a giant warehouse and then after three years a destroy sticker got got stuck onto that box and then everything in the box got destroyed <laughs> so to me that's one of the biggest problems of trying to digitize the construction industry and also trying to build ai products in the construction industry we don't have like a rich historical data set with millions and millions of projects that we can um, build these models from a lot of work is being done in the space um, notably m plan have um, built really impressive ai tech Qflow are utilizing um, machine learning tech in a really clever way. And I think that's what you've got to do. Mm. Um, I, I think this uh, kind of magical BIM product that's going to predict how to build the perfect building, make it zero carbon and make it as cheap as possible and make it as optimized as possible. Um, I think that's a long, long way into the future while we build up all of these, these records. Um, and those digital records are being captured and um, the RICS are doing great work in this space. The Built Environment Carbon Database, for example, is, is trying to, to gather this data set so that we can build those AI products in the future. But I think for now, um, what we've got to do is use the tools at hand and, and Circular has done that by um, you know, utilizing a large language model, which has been built for another purpose and applying it for a specific problem within the industry. Um, but yeah, it, it's exciting and more stuff is getting developed every single day. Um, but yeah, we need that data quality first. As you say, and I think that that's probably you know, uh, all this kind of interest in in AI and these generative models has made the sector realise that it does need to sort of uh, get its act together in terms of data. I mean, what the way you described that uh, uh, document uh, issue at your your uh, previous job was very much like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, really, wasn't it? Just this warehouse full of uh, <laughs> boxes of data that eventually just disappear. Uh, back to Circular it, it, it itself, who's the customer? You know, who who is it being made for and, and why do they need it? So Circular is, was really made for the SME market to give sort of a democratized access to that carbon data um, in a scalable way, which isn't sort of cutting into to everyone's margin so much. Um, and I think there's a lot of pressure across the construction industry, um, but especially, um, you know, the SMEs always get the blunt end of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and very, very little protection. Um, um, you know, uh, when COVID hit, a lot of people took out a lot of financing to keep everything stable. 
um, and we're starting to see sort of the um, the financial effects of that on this end. Um, so when regulations get tighter, for example, whole life carbon assessment is now mandate in the Greater London area. It's, it's a matter of, the, of time before that starts to come into other cities. Um, that's going to affect disproportionately the SMEs first. You know, the, the larger companies have been working on this for, for a really long time and they have big sustainability departments and great understanding of what's going on in sustainability. Um, and the SMEs don't have that. Um, and the way that they solve it is to um, subcontract it and uh, probably take a big hit on that, that subcontract. So what we wanted to do is open it up and uh, help the, uh, the wider industry engage with carbon assessment and make it as easy as possible mm. um, for that market too. And I suppose it's a slightly strange question to, to, to ask, but you, you mentioned obviously using the EC3 database of, of EPDs. And, and I guess one of the questions that I'm always bound to ask slightly is, is what are the limitations at the moment in doing these embodied carbon assessments? Because not every product has an EPD. You're still kind of reliant on, on data sets that themselves are going to be of, um, how shall I put it, of you know, different quality in terms of, of, of the kind of information you're getting. What, what do you see as the, the fundamental issues that are still holding us back by doing these carbon assessments? Yeah, it's it's really tricky. Um, and I come across them in my day to day work. Um, and I know it's very frustrating for any sustainability consultants out there. Um, you'll have a, a sort of 600 line cost plan um, and you're trying to populate this document with with valid sources. Um, and there's so many things that can go wrong. They can be out of date. It can be wrongly product coded. It can be in date correct product, but for a different geography, it's for the <laughs> German market. Um, and this leaves gaps in your in your cost plan. And um, those gaps are big question marks uh, that could be um, it could be a couple of kilograms of carbon, or it could be a couple of tons of carbon. Um, and that's that's not great um, in terms of, of accuracy and consistency too. So I think there's going to be a bit of pain um, in the early adoption. Um, I think it's only going to get better. Um, I, I recently went to a panel um, where Simon Sturgis, sort of the the whole um, whole life carbon assessment lead. Uh, for the government was kind of asked the question, uh, how how are we going to maintain records of whole life carbon assessments going forward? What's going to be um, comparable historically? And uh, it, it was such a difficult question. The, the, the whole panel was kind of silent. Um, but the, the consensus was really that um, because of the improving industry and the improving data quality, it's almost an iterative process that, that we're in. Um, and kind of um, the last measured time point is what we have to go by. Um, and the best quality data is, is the most recently measured quality data. Um, so we need more investment. We need investment from um, the um, material manufacturers. We need investment from the government. Um, we need investment from industry bodies to create general EPDs too and help fill those gaps. Um, yeah, it's, it's just going to take time, I think. It is. Now, you mentioned already your, your focus 
uh, very sensibly on that SME sector, given they're very much on the sharp end. And I think also, in general terms, it's great to hear about the kind of democratization of data and tech, because it, you know, it, sh it shouldn't just be the preserve of, of, of the big firms in, in any part of the kind of built environment. What other advice would you have for SMEs, where, as you say yourself, they won't have a, they won't have a head of sustainability or a sustainability department? Well, I mean, what kind of practical things can they actually do to, to drive down the embodied carbon in their products? Yeah, it's 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 a tricky one, um, and you can kind of be um, sort of blinded by the amount of information out there, not really knowing what's relevant. Um, the the first piece of advice I would have is uh, engage with the UK Green Building Council. Um, they have a lot of resources on how to um, sort of start your sustainability journey. Um, one of the, the first um, and sort of easiest baselines you can do is set a company sustainability pro policy. Mm -hmm. um, just figure out what are the big hitters in terms of carbon in your practice. Um, and yeah, my key piece of advice is what isn't measured isn't managed. It's kind of a cliche in this industry, but you've got to measure that baseline and understand where you're measuring up in in terms of embodied carbon um, and then you can you can see the ways to improve it from there um, and of course uh, a lean way to to do that is to try circular yeah. Uh, yeah. Plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah come talk to me email me and um, Indeed, uh, as you say, it's about getting that baseline, isn't it, to, to compare yourself to. So, I mean, put, putting your, getting your sort of predictive skills out. But I mean, what, what, what do you see as the kind of evolution of this construction carbon space going forward? Whether it's regulatory requirements, driving from project sponsors, what sort of you know drivers and changes do you see in the next you know few years? Yeah, I think uh, the big um, hitter is going to be regulation. Um, there's there's kind of two two schools of thought on it. It's um, either the the planning regulations are going to drag us kicking and screaming into um, measuring carbon in our projects um, and have it as um, another sort of planning hurdle. Um, and then there's the building regulation side. Um, so Part Z have been campaigning uh, for a really long time to um to have embodied carbon represented in the building regulations um i think that's right um i think the the planners have a lot to deal with um and this is this is kind of another another burden um also we could have both um that's also a likely outcome that will have um sort of a measurement hurdle um for for the councils and then also a building regulations um, kind of checks and balances on the other side. Indeed. And uh, I sort of final question, going back to your particular road, Matt, what, what sort of exciting things are you, are you working on over the next uh, few months and you know, 2024? Yes, yeah, so um, Circular has been busy building our measurement product for three years now. Um, and we've We've established a way to go from um, cost plan to whole life carbon assessment in a very short space of time, um, which is great, but we can't just stop at measurement. We need to push it further and uh, start driving down carbon in that, in that early stage of planning. Um, so for us, something key that we want to build is a smart suggestion feature. Mm -hmm. Um, so this could be as simple as um, when you're searching on Amazon um, and you're sort of putting your basket together and you get your total at the end, um, having uh, some suggestions based on what you've uh, put down in terms of lower carbon solutions. We have to be careful with that because there's uh, other implications from material changes that we need mm. to take into account. Um, so data will be critical um, and really strong metadata will be will be key in that. 
and there's a lot of um, good sources out there. Um, one who has already been on your podcast, Andrew, uh, 2050 Materials. Yeah. They're doing absolutely brilliant work on um, making a really robust data set, which kind of unifies um, a lot of the metadata that you're required to specify, not just for low embodied carbon, but also for things like um, structural uh, changes and fire safety will be key as well. We'll need that data too. Um, so yes, uh, a way of sort of um, allowing our users to find easy solutions or quick wins to drive down embodied carbon and to bring that into an earlier stage um, will be key for us. So that's what we'll be working on in 2024. No, fascinating and, and, and clearly very important as you say that, that we're always trying to balance so many constraints here in terms of cost, you know, functionality, safety, you know, it, you can't just pull one lever without understanding how it affects the other part of the project. But uh, fascinating to talk and, and as ever brings home how critical it is now that the sector really does address these data issues that, that unfortunately do bedevil the sector and hold us back to some extent in terms of improving these incredibly important things like sustainability, whether it's embodied or operational carbon. Well, for today, Isabel, thanks ever so much for your time and I look forward to, to catching up again in the future. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Andrew. Great to speak. Pleasure.